Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. I'm here with an amazingly talented guitar player today, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the records he's played on, um, and you've heard him playing for sure. Uh, with George Bernhardt, he's a Canadian guy, he attended the Ontario Conservatory of Music, graduating in 1973. Uh, between 75 and 83, he played and toured with Lee Aaron, who was a Canadian singer who had some really huge hard rock and metal hits during that time. Then in 1985, he was signed by Irving Azoff with his band Hanover. They recorded one album, and they toured with metal band Saxon. In 86, he moved to Milwaukee, and he formed Tokyo Rose. They recorded and released one self-titled album. And then in 88, he moved to L.A. upon request from the former singer of Tokyo Rose. In, um, when he was in L.A., he was with a band called Bo Nasty. And Bo Nasty also featured Brian Young, who we interviewed here in episode 164. Great interview if you want to check it out. But uh, George and Brian played together. They recorded and released one album called Dirty But Well Dressed, and they toured with Love, Hate, and Loverboy. And if I remember correctly, Bo Nasty, you guys had like wardrobe changes and everything, right? Uh, Bo Nasty, we, we only did a uh, – let's see. Let me get this thing set up. We, um, we only toured – it was – like a glam band kind of thing you know mm, yeah and so being that it was like the glam band jeez uh, oh, i lost you craig no worries there man you, there you are all right yeah it was it was kind of a glam band thing it was right at the end of it was right pre um the grunge movement it was still in the you know eyeliner you know Poofy hair, all that stuff. Yeah, well, you have great hair, man. I looked at some of your pictures, and <laughs> holy shit, that picture you had of you, and uh, you put a picture of the day up with you and your wife for years ago. Oh, man, that's when we met. Yeah, oh, my God. I, didn't, that, I, I think you had more hair than she did, George, actually. That was right at, that was right at the height of Bone Nasty. <laughs> yeah. Um, in 89, 90, they formed, uh, George formed Slammed, uh, band with singer jeff scott soto that's uh Yngwie singer they recorded wrote and co-produced one five song ep and in 1990 this is like the apex of of any musician's world is to get into a band like this the mustard seeds if you've never heard of the mustard seeds please check them out they're fucking amazing just just an incredibly talented rock band i mean just first class writing producing engineering and just the playing is with matt and greg bissonette Doug Bossy was the other guitar player, along with George. Uh, if you want to check out Doug, I interviewed him in episodes 93 and 94 of this show. Uh, to date, George feels that's the single most meaningful band in music he's ever had the honor of being a part of. And having listened to at least Mustard Seeds 3, God, that's a, just a phenomenal CD. Um, the three CDs that band recorded was Bulldozer, Red, and Seeds 3. And George was the engineer on Seeds 3. Then in 1999, he partnered up and joined Rick Springfield's band. He, pay, he recorded three CDs with Rick, Venus and Overdrive, Songs for the End of the World, and Rocket Scientist. And he was with Rick straight through 2015, which is like almost unheard of, isn't it? It was, uh, it was the, the, the capacity in which I first started, and we'll get into that, to where, where I left off in 2015. It was a great ride. It was a great tour, great great group of people a great organization to work for it was awesome it's That's incredible fantastic um and through 1990 99 he also spent a great deal of time doing sessions especially for jingle companies and we'll talk about that recently george moved to nashville with his family he's retired and he's enjoying being a dad and he's writing playing guitar and recording songs at his own leisure and on his own terms. I lives life by my own rules. I like that. Once uh, once he gets settled in, they're going to figure out uh, what the Bernhards want to do. But he's enjoying. How are you enjoying Nashville so far? Man, I love it here. People are nice. First time, they? first time in my life, I've had to sit in a lawnmower and actually drive it around to cut the grass. <laughs> <laughs> how, how is that? I've not done that. How is that? You know, it's a whole different 
different set of, of rules and and uh, protocols. <laughs> Headphones, cigars, what do you what do you like? hey, you know, you know, I was a little focused because it's the first time I've done it. So, you know, you're a little nervous, you yeah. know, you don't want to make the lines too crooked, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I'd be concerned about hitting somebody. I'm such a klutz. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, well, you're living domestic life. Good for you now. But Nashville's nice. The people are wonderful there, man. Real easy. Oh, I want. I wanted to add one thing it, when you were talking about the mustard seeds. Yes, Greg Bissonette was in the uh, in the mustard seeds in its inception first, but then George Palacios, who is currently with Rick Springfield drumming, took over. So uh, our our red CD has part. Greg playing drums on it and part George. It was like kind of half and half. The, uh, actually, sorry, the Bulldozer CD. Okay. There's tracks with Greg and then there's tracks. That's when George first joined the band, but he was an exceptional player. What a band that was, man, in general. It was just a great oh, cool. It was awesome. It was, a, it was a joy. It was a blessing, let me tell you. So let's go back and talk uh, about that major label signing. Uh, you signed to a major label, 85, by Irving Azoff, who was admittedly one of the top label heads in the United States at that time. Yep. Um, what's the backstory to that? Um, Hanover was, it was originally called Hanover Fist, but that name had been taken. So it was a band that was started, it, it was conceived by a fella singer named Frank Zerone, and then uh, it was kind of, it had a production company, John Victor, which was the money behind it, and the producer, who was another awesome guitar player, unbelievable producer, writer, Stacy Hayden, who played with uh, David Bowie and Iggy Pop. And uh, this is we're going we're going way back to the to the 80s, but um, so that whole thing got started, and it it took a while for the band to actually get signed. I was kind of like, I was, you know, writing songs with Frank. It was like so weird the way we met in a little teeny studio auditioning drummers when I was in Lee Aaron, because we, we our, our drummer, we had a hard time hanging on to drummers in Lee Aaron. So we go into this little studio in Scarborough and the guy that's running this little studio, that's like an eight track studio, you know, we're recording, we needed to record so we could hear the drummers back and make our pick. And happened to be Frank Zerone, this guy that's putting this band together. And after we got done, Lierren got done auditioning drummers. You know, I'm packing up my gear. Everybody's gone. I was always the last guy out because I had always had all this crap load of gear. Anyways, he's like, hey, I got this like side project going on here, trying to put together, looking for writers. And, you know, and, you know, I liked what you were doing. So I started talking to him and. Sure enough, I'm like, man, these songs are great. You're doing a great job writing them. Sure, I'd be interested. And so that's how I became involved with uh, Frank Zerone and what eventually became Hanover and signed to MCA Records. What happened there? Like, you know, you did the one album and you toured. Was it just not enough, you know, mo um, what do you call it, momentum behind it? Or You know, it, it, I never understood that either how, how why Hanover never really kind of took off I mean it had all the had Butch Stone managing the band and we had MCA behind us you know I did the money run out you know I, I was never a part of that the the business end of that particular band I was kind of I was more like you know the guitar player that a hired kind of gun yeah I had a hand in writing you know, the songs on, on the CD, some of the songs there. And uh, the, the recording band was a completely different set of guys from the live touring band. You know, the live touring band was Hired Guns. Uh, you know, I just don't know. I You know, that whole, that, the, I think the trouble with MCA and what stemmed from that payola thing with Irving Azoff, I mean, I know nothing about it, but Aside from, yeah, there was something that went down with the payola thing. And so all of a sudden, MCA bands started getting dropped left and right. We happened to be in that bundle of bands that got dropped. So mm -hmm. nothing ever happened beyond that. Sure. Um, what, wh why'd you originally move out to, like, what did you move out to LA to do originally? And did you wind up doing it? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I did. Um, it's funny back and I have to, I have to backtrack to Lee Aaron it was, um, uh, with Lee, with, there was, there was this singer, Lee, it, Lee Aaron kind of started all because that was my, that was my high school band. You oh, know? you're kidding me. No, that was a high school band that got signed. Holy crap. Can you tell, I, I could hear Lee Aaron singing these songs. Can you tell them some of the hits? They were like really massive hits. I mean, she's in Canada. I mean, I was involved in the, uh, there was an album called Metal Queen. Metal Queen, yeah. right. And, and that was sort of like a heavy metal, you know, it was right in the apex of Judas Priest. I mean, the big heavy metal move, Iron Maiden. I mean, all the British metal bands, you know, like the invasion of metal, you know, she was just a, a, an amazing singer. And I remember, I mean, the whole inception of, of Lee Aaron was interesting because I remember we, Lee Aaron was a band prior to Karen, who was the lead singer, Karen Greening, um, actually being in the band. We were called Lee Aaron prior to that. Oh, you're and we kidding! Were, what we were like, like the original <laughs> dude. The original singer was the, the name. It comes from um, Lee Jeans and Aaron Spelling. Oh my God, that is so yeah, th awesome! This is this is this is like information that like nobody really knows. You heard it here I, first on Everyone Loves Guitar. I don't know if I should be divulging it, but the the first inception of of what was Lee Aaron was you know just a bunch of high school kids. And we were having a hard time. We had a great singer named Gord Crone, but you know, it just it just never, you know, there was it wasn't a, a commitment or a dedication on his part. So we're like, golly, we got to find a singer. We got to find a singer. And then our bass player Graham Thompson goes, "Well, I know this. There's this chick at school that sings really, really good. And this is like a rival school. I'm, I, we're growing up and going to school in Bramalee, and there's another town right next to us called Brampton, and." with a whole bunch of other high schools and and so he's like and we're like all like what a chick are you crazy what are you nuts oh <laughs> man forget it yeah no way man you know we want to do like heavy stuff you know anyway so when bush came to shove it's just like man we don't have a singer and i'm not one to carry the lead vocals i tried it and it was like it's not my thing i'd rather focus on guitar and background vocals and stuff but um then came to pass that you know okay well let's try this chick out and sure enough, she came down with her dad and her dad was and, and it was a wonderful thing that his, her dad was so involved in her career and just making sure that his daughter's, you know, going to be, you know, <laughs> I do the same thing. Oh, with my hell daughters. yeah. I'm, I have an 18 yeah. year old. You believe me. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, she came down and she sang like a bird. We had to learn a couple of songs. We had to learn a Fleetwood Mac song and, and some other, you know, she's been singing Barbara Streisand and this she, Karen had some pipes. She still has pipes. This chick, I was like, oh my gosh, this chick can really sing. Being being classically trained, you know, and having growing up in a family where my mom sings in an opera and stuff, I'm like, this chick can really, really sing. Oh, wow. And, and so, but the whole Fleetwood Mac thing, I'm like, well, I, I could see us playing heart, but Fleetwood Mac is just a little light for us, mm. you know? I mean, it's great music, but it's just a little light mm. for our direction. And so, you know, Barracuda and Magic Man and all that stuff that Hart did was just spectacular. Yeah. Then, you know, Pat Benatar. And so our whole thing. And I remember, you know, she was definitely in the in, in the Barbara Streisand mode and, and singing, you know, as a trained singer. And we're like, man, it'd be really, really cool to have a chick and just like a spin on it. And so I remember when we said when the Heaven and Hell album came out, OK, and the way Dio sang. That was like our our go to album. <laughs> you know, oh, what a great that, album that was. Oh, jeez Louise, both of those, you know, both mm -hmm. of those albums. And so we we're like, Karen, if you could sing like this guy and just like do it like a chick, and she just took it and ran with it, and the rest is history. That's awesome. So, that is so we did a great story, man. And so we did. So we, you know, that was. I was in the band, but then us punks, you know, we did the Lee Aaron thing. But we were just punks, fresh out of high school, just being complete idiots, you know. And the manager that managed Karen was a little more serious about it, and so was she. But we were complete boneheads, <laughs> going out there on the road, drinking, partying, just being complete idiots, and not guys. really taking being guys <laughs> and not taking 
not taking what could potentially be a wonderful career seriously. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, you know, we, we actually got axed, you know, from Lee Aaron manager took her and she did a bunch of other things, you know, and he took her career, you know, a couple of years later, she, she'd done a couple of recordings with some famous Canadian musicians. She did a duet with Buzz Sherman, with Moxie and, you know, Rick Santers, and there was a bunch of other Canadian acts that, you know, the manager had put her together with. Anyways, come around, she loses her band, and I call up the manager. I go, look, it, I got a killer band right now that needs a singer. Once again, I'm singerless. We had a great singer, and this is the singer Mark Anthony Fretz that was in, in, in a band with me. He's the guy that went to Milwaukee. So that's, that's my Tokyo lead to Rose. Milwaukee. Yes. Okay. So anyways, so we become Karen's band. Manager sends us out there. He says, George, you know, you guys, I'd like to record an album. Let's get serious about this. I have interest from Attic Records. I have a label. Go out. He put us on tour for like two, three weeks out west. He says, when you guys come back, I want an album done and written, ready to record. So he gave us kind of an objective and a mission, which was, you know, at this point in my life, I'm like, you know what? This is serious. If I want to do this seriously, here's an opportunity to do it, to do it and to do it with, you know, uh, 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 Karen, Lee Aaron, that kind of the whole thing started, you know. So we, we got serious and, man, she, she's a prolific writer, great, great artist, great talent. And so it was fun writing an album. We came back and we had an album and we recorded it, you know, and um I still had in my mind Mark Anthony Fretz because this guy was like he's you know he could sing he had that really high stuff he could do like Rob Halford yeah. but then he had that Dio David Coverdale you know vibe to his voice which was you know what every you know guitar player wants in his band that that type of singer at, back at that time so he moved to Milwaukee I left Lee Aaron didn't we didn't did the Metal Queen album toured that did a, did the Reading Festival did a bunch of stuff then. Then I went to, uh, and it's interesting, when we were recording the Metal Queen album, Hanover, Frank Zerone, they were getting ready to come in recording. Karen went from, in phase one, from Studio A to Studio B to do her lead vocal overdubs. I left my equipment set up, and Hanover comes in to record that album. Wow. So it was, it was, yeah, it was just the way things happened and just the, the momentum that was going on in my career at that time was pretty spectacular. It's, I mean, if, if great. I, I kind of won the lottery in that, in that respect. So it was, it was really cool. And I wish I would have been a little more serious and a little more mature at that time to really take in, you know, yeah. what was happening. So anyways, so moving on. Hanover did its thing. I left Lee Aaron, and and um, actually, it was another great. When we were recording the Metal Queen album, manager decided to bring in another guitar player, and this wasn't a band decision. This was a manager's decision. Guys, I think you should have another guitar player. I got this guy John Albany, who lives here in Nashville now, but killer killer guitar player from Canada, from Toronto, was in a band called Rabbit. Great guitar player, really, 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 kind of like um, uh, black Les Paul custom, curly black hair, handlebar mustache, you know, kind of a Neil Sean kind he of He was the guy. Could, could sing like a bird, write songs like There's No Tomorrow. So he was an asset. And when we got him in the studio, I was like, holy cow, I've heard of him. I know who he is. I know, you know, his, his uh, resume. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool having this guy. So got a guitar guitar playing partner in there. So John, anyways, John kind of added his things, wrote his songs in the metal queen. He had a, he co-wrote a bunch of songs with us, anyways. But uh, and you know, long story short, just my interest, the direction, and just what was going on. It seemed like Hanover was more of you know the heavy kind of thing that was going on. You know, because I toured with Lee Aaron after the Metal Queen thing and everything had gone and then came time to write a second album. And I've been always been in contact with Frank from Hanover going, hey, man, you know, would you be interested in, you know, touring and doing this? You know, I'd already recorded the album with with Stacy and all these great musicians, the list of Canadian musicians, you know, 
A-list guys that played on the Hanover album was awesome. You know, I, I, I should probably give credit where credit is due with, you know, with Stacy picking and Frank picking some great guys to play on that album. And I was pretty fortunate and lucky to uh, to have been part of that. But um, I left Learn, did that, and there was like a lull where I wasn't doing anything. Finally, Frank got money. Finally, the tour was about to happen for Hanover. We had to put a band together. None of the original guys that had recorded were left to go. You know, Hanover had a momentum, but it just just petered out, fizzled out. So we hired a couple of guys, got a, a bass player and a drummer. And out we went, and that's when we toured with Saxon. Went to Milwaukee and played. Who's there? Mark Anthony Fretz <laughs> from way back. And so he's like, he's in a band, and I'm like, man, this guy's got a set of pipes. I remember, you know, him being in a band with me. So, anyways, Hanover finished the Saxon tour and um, ended up going back to Canada. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So Mark's like, hey, if you're interested, we got a band down here in Milwaukee. Our guitar player is leaving. You want to come down here? I'm like, geez, Louise, well, okay. So I went down there, and it was interesting because I'm like, look, if I come down here and join a band, I kind of auditioned for what was at the time called The Machine, and then it became Tokyo Rose. But um, I was like, look, my objective is, now that I know how important an album is and how important that is to support, you know, to go out there and support as a band, it's like, I don't want to sell bar, you know, bars, beers. Yeah, yeah you know, bar owners, beers, what I want to do is I want to sell records. So I went down there and said, look, man, we got to be recording an album in a year. We'll write it, we'll do, put it together, but I want to be recording an album in a year. So I moved to Milwaukee. That's how I ended up in the States. And uh, we recorded the Tokyo Rose album. That once again involved Stacy Hayden. Okay. I called him. I said, look, man, you know, would you be interested in coming down here and producing and doing this album? This is the singer I've been telling you about for years. He's a great singer. And he said, sure, let's get, let's put it together. So once again, I just put, you know, Stacy kind of in charge and said, here, man, you put it together. We'll, I'll, I'll be in charge of, you know, with the band writing the songs and putting that together. We'll rehearse it. But, you know, this is your forte is putting all this stuff together. And he did. And we recorded a band called... Tokyo Rose, and it was just a self-entitled album. It was a great album too. It was fun, but it was it, it just didn't ca- get the steam that it that it needed in the Midwest. You know, yeah. it didn't have the backing of a big record company. It was all done kind of independently, so it just didn't get the push. But it was a great band. It was a lot of fun. Good musicians, great players. Once again, when we're right at the end of recording the Tokyo Rose album, Mark leaves, quits the band and goes to Los Angeles. Ugh. So I'm I'm left in Milwaukee with an album that's finished, the singer, the voice that's on the album. And quite honestly, Stacy Stacy, um, you remember a band called Sheriff? No, I don't, to be honest with you. A- anyways, gr- great singer and um he he um Freddie Freddie Kirchy did the backgrounds on there and we're like, "Man, well, I've got all these singer guys on this Tokyo Rose album and and our lead singer just left. What are we going to do without that singer? We really can't do anything because there's nobody's going to sound like him. He's on the album. So why did he I leave? A, I, you know, that that's a question that's been pending for years. You know, <laughs> he got a, he got a call from a, a, a fella in uh, Los Angeles who was um, a guitar player and he heard a demo tape that Mark had done from years ago, I think from a band called Zillion from Buffalo. Anyways, and he heard the tape and said, I want this singer. So he had, this is where the big record companies, the law firm and all that, he found out where Mark was, called him up and said, hey, look, this guy wants to put a band around, this guitar player here. So sure enough, he's like, Bales, here's my chance to get to L.A. So they had the one thing you guys were missing, sort of. And that, they had the, the big record company, the money. Yeah. That being said, you guys had a completed record. Right. Oh, yeah. You wonder why you wouldn't just like go six months just to something to see if it get any tra- traction. That's just life. You yeah. Know? People people yeah. make decisions and Absolutely. they make, you know, things happen for a reason. Yeah. I'm with you on that. You know, and so, but... You know, as it as it was, we tried to put it together, the Tokyo Rose in Milwaukee, and it just wasn't coming together. It was just so difficult 
to put it together. It just wasn't meant to be. And um, I get a call from Mark. Hey, George, I got this thing set up in L.A. You know, <laughs> I met this. I met this unbelievable guitar player. It's just like ridiculous. And I want I want to get you guys together to write an album together. You know, start writing some songs. And I'd like to get you out to California. Who's the other guitar player? Brian Young. Oh, okay. Here it comes full circle. That's wild, man. Holy so I'm like, crap. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I fly out. Hold on a second. I, one, one question for you. Did it enter your mind at the time, like, you know, that sounds good, but how do I know you're not going to do the same thing and bolt again? I mean, maybe you didn't say that to him, or maybe you did, but that had to enter your mind. It was it was on the back of my mind, but what he had going and the level of excitement in, in I could tell Mark was frustrated in Tokyo Rose. Okay, uh, you, you can you can just tell you have a sense about it. You're like, yeah, this isn't you know when the passion leaves a musician, an artist in a project that you're in, you can just feel it. Yeah. You know, everybody knows it. So um, he was very passionate about it, and he was really excited about it. And I'm like, okay, but. All right, so I went out, I wrote a couple of songs. You know, I, I did like what five, I wrote like five or ten songs and I just demoed them off real quick, four track kind of stuff. And they flew me out to LA to, you know, to meet Brian, to get together with Mark, and to get together with the people involved and record a demo and see how it worked. We didn't have a band, it was just basically, you know, me, Mark, and Brian. And so I was, I was just overwhelmed at how good Brian was. That guy plays more. That guy could play more notes in ten minutes than I could play in <laughs> one year. He was amazing. Brian's Brian was the first time that I saw up close and personal somebody that shreds like that. Yeah. Ridiculous, you know. And so Brian and I got along perfectly. It was like, wow, this is an opportunity. And this is fun. So I have to go back to Milwaukee. What does What does Mark decide? Hey, why don't Why does Why don't you and Brian go back to Milwaukee? Okay, write a bunch of more songs, and then it was an adventure, and this is the coolest thing that I did with Brian, was driving from Milwaukee in my 1975 Maverick, <laughs> three on the tree, <laughs> this is, <laughs> three on the tree, wow. with, with my amp, my head, and guitars, and just Brian and I, we spent a couple of weeks in Milwaukee writing songs, you know, just recording on little cassettes, ideas and stuff like that. And him and I drove from Milwaukee all the way back to Los Angeles. With all and, your stuff? Uh, like you, you, with, you with all my stuff. My wow. Hand, my rack and all that and all that and all that the equipment that I had at the time because all I had was my luggage, my clothing, and my equipment. That's sure. it. Never really never really set roots in Milwaukee. I did to a degree, but you know, I always knew that if opportunity comes knocking, I have to be mobile. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, you know, <laughs> looking in hindsight, you know, that you're younger and so, and I'm all by myself, not married, not committed. So it was, sure. you know, but uh, it was cool, Brian and I, and we, and I ended up in LA and we recorded that album, worked our butts off and everything was in place. Had, had, uh, Air Weddlestein and Laird was the law firm, you know, had, uh, had, uh, Jerry Greenberg at WTG Records was heading up the whole operation everything was in place we you know guys okay come and the lawyer jerry edelstein i learned so much from that man it was incredible biggest law firm the 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 clientele at that law firm you're talking dolly parton whoopi goldberg dan Aykroyd, you know tommy lee you know motley crew john bon jovi i mean the roster of clients in that office was absurd what did you learn? Incredible. You said you learned so much, like along the way. I, I learned, I learned from Jerry because he was a really, really wonderful man. And and in hindsight, I'm like, wow, for him to even take that time, because I worked as a file clerk at Arrow Edelstein and Laird for a time being, hmm. just to make money. Yeah, he was like, yeah, why don't you come in here and work? And so, anytime anything was going taking place with um, Bo Nasty. He was like, okay, guys, here, this is how we can do this. And he would divulge all this information to us and, and show us, you know, how that blueprint worked, what steps are needed to take place. What, and he kept us as part of the decision-making piece of the puzzle. 
Well, what do you Instead guys of putting want you do? in the dark like most of the time they do. Right. And so it That's was nice. really enlightening. And he was such a kind, generous, and just sweet guy. I, I, it was amazing. And Brian and Mark and everybody in Bonasty will tell you that about Jerry. He was just a, an amazing guy. And, and he was so humble. So we learned, we learned a lot. And it, 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 was, it was fun, but by the same token, it, it was hard because we recorded that. See, did, Jerry goes, well, okay, have you guys thought about producers? Who do you want to produce this? I'm just like, oh, my gosh, we have a shot at getting, like, you know, maybe Ted Templeman. Maybe Bo Hill, maybe, you know, one of these big top notch producers, engineers and their staff and and get to go do it. The record company's ready to throw down. So we went and we checked the availability of all kinds of producers. Sure enough, Bo Hill, you know, we liked what he'd done. And so we we're like, yeah, let's see if he's available. Bo Hill was available and Bo Hill was like, he, he kind of executive produced it. He kind of threw it into Paul Winger. Hmm. Into his lap, and you know the Winger brothers, man. Those guys sing like birds. You know they Kip, Paul, and yeah, what was the other Scott Winger? Was that his name? I can't remember his name. Anyways, you know he kind of gave it into Paul's hand to produce Bone Bone Nasty. That worked out great. He did a killer job. Um, when it came to mixing, I don't know something kind of fell apart in the mixing thing. So we got uh, uh, Steve Thompson and Michael Barbiero to mix it in New York. Now, Barbiero, that name I even know because he's probably mixed a ton of stuff, hasn't he? If, if I know that and name. We're talking, oh, what are those guys? Um, Guns N' Roses. Uh, those, are, those guys are big name guys. And so, you know, that, that happened through the record company. Well, we can get, you know, Steve Thompson, Michael Barbie, Mike, Steve Thompson, Michael Barbiero to mix this album at, uh, at Bearsville in New York. Upstate, sure enough. Yeah. Dude. These guys, they were unbelievable. Their work ethic, the way these guys tag team as mixing engineers, you know, getting, they mixed it. Next thing you know, we put it out and it's like, okay, now we're sitting. We're like, okay, we're ready to tour. And, and musical change is starting to happen. You know, the, the, the glam bands or, you know, the, the poisons, the makeup bands, the spandex, the big hair and all that is starting to slowly be phased out and we're running out of time. And so the record company put us out on a tour with Loverboy. And then we did another tour with Love Hate. And then when we got back after that tour, the grunge scene had taken, had, had gone in, you know, taken full, just sprung roots. And that was it. Glam was out and gone. That's and so was, amazing. so was Bone Nasty because it was a glam band, basically. Big hair, you know, pop, kind of, you know. Wow, that kind of music. So it happened, so, and, and so it's, and there's nothing you can do with that. I mean, that's like nothing. Yeah, you're right. Wow. You, you know, there's there's the there's the hills and the valleys, and this is this was a valley. It was a musical change. It was it was bound to happen. You know, the glam was is was going to dry up, and it did. And then the grunge thing happened, and so that's. Uh, I remember I was Mark got frustrated the singer and he left again the whole band kind of when we got back you could feel it you could tell that it was just everybody kind of scattered how did no the one, tour go tours were great you know it was fun we had we had fun you know played great the band was great the, you know brian myself mike tarana on drums um doug baker on bass and mark singing it was a great band mm -hmm. it was a fun band good guys but when we got back to L.A., everybody knew that it was it's not going to happen. You know, Mark had, you know, Mark had taken up drinking. And so that was frustrating some of the non drinkers in the band. And it was just, you know, just things the, the commitment wasn't there and it started to fall apart. And I could feel that it's falling apart. I had that one meeting with, uh, with Jerry Edelstein he says, look, I know it's falling apart, but the, you guys are signed to two records. You have another record waiting for you. And I'm like, and this is one of my mistakes in my career. I didn't take him up on it. He said, look, it, if you can put something together, you have another you have another album to do. Whether it's with these guys or not, you can do it. But, you know, let me know if you can. So it was kind of thrown in my court after everybody disbanded. And I had that meeting with Jerry and I was like, oh, it, 
I couldn't do it. I didn't have the energy to do it. It was I was so um, not discouraged, but just the change in music scene had happened. The band had fallen apart, and all these things had happened in sequence that I didn't have the energy to do it. And I'm like, I can't do it, Jerry. I just there's no way I can do it. And so there I go, I'm sitting on my butt doing nothing, just continue writing songs. I'm stuck in L.A. You know, so I'm a survivor. I did all kinds of crazy jobs to survive. But, uh, but you know, in all me. fairness to you, it wasn't one. This was the second go round. You know, get, getting a band up and running is like getting a business up and running. In the oh, beginning, yeah. it is a fucking grind. And it's a grind until, you know, I was liken it to like a plane taking off the runway. It's a grind until you've got momentum to get off the runway. Yep. And that takes a while. And so now this is your second in a in a row where you like grind 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 and then like you know that you had to walk away before the plane got momentum. So that's that's I know for me like I've had that same thing happen and after those two after two you need a break, man. In a, in a sense, I, it, it, it's you, you know you can only do so many do overs in a certain period of time. It, plus, musically, in terms of direction, I, you know, I'm lost. I went from from Lee Aaron that was heavy, Hanover that was heavy, Tokyo Rose it was pop, then came out to you know to Los Angeles musically right and, and just, this is strictly from a writer standpoint because I've always been writing you know it went to that glam pop kind of rock now this grunge thing happened that was completely foreign I loved it I thought it was totally awesome and and I didn't know where I fit in in that yeah as a writer so so here's you know here I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place as a writer not just as a guitar player but as a writer because I, I realized that at an early age writing is the key yeah you know you can you can you can you can be proficient and you can be a virtuoso at your instrument but bottom line is you got to be able to write you yeah. got to be able to write songs that people are going to enjoy so here I am stuck with this grunge scene going on and and the tie into into uh, the mustard seeds is during bone nasty in the early stages we had outside writers we co-wrote a song with eddie schwartz mm. we we had a uh, too loud mcleod killer guitar player brian mcleod from uh, uh um what the uh, what the heck is <laughs> i just listened to their song gone 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 you've been gone so long it's been gone 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 for so long what the heck is the name of that band canadian band huge band anyways killer guitar player did the head pins with darby mills anyways co-write with him he came down we had a meeting with him i was tickled pink to go oh my gosh we're gonna write with brian mcleod too loud mcleod from little mountain sound are you <laughs> kidding me who else was in there that we we're gonna write with matt bissonette all of a sudden oh so that's how you met those guys that's how i met matt and and so in in um, we wrote a bunch of songs with with uh matt and the way this the 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 bone nasty ties into the mustard seeds is that Matt was co-writing songs with Mark. One day, Mark goes, hey, you want to come over to uh, Matt's house? He's in Woodland Hills, and I'm writing songs with him. Maybe you can come down and play on some of the tracks. I go, sure, man, I'd love to. You know, So I get down to you know, Matt and Greg are living together in this house in, in Woodland Hills, and Matt's got his studio set up, and I'm like, okay, well, what are we going to write? So we wrote a song, and just the, the way Matt and I worked in a studio environment – it was just like bang, 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 bang. Okay, we got a song. And it was that quick and that painless, and it was fun. And you know, I guess at that point, that's when Matt kind of took notice and was like, "Hey, man, good job today." You know, whatever. And I'm like, "Wow, this is the guy from David Lee Roth, his brothers." Like, I'm like, "Holy cow, these guys are players." Right. You know. In the meantime, you know, and that's how I met Matt. In between, in between, Bone Nasty and the Mustard Seeds, I got together with Jeff Scott Soto, and that was just. I was I was writing songs and I was like I met Jeff through Brian Young and I'm like man I'm not I'm not a lyricist I'm not a singer but I've got these songs that I've written man I'd love to see if I can get Jeff interested just mm. to sing on them just to co-write some songs just to do something and so I I got my little you know 8 track little cassette demo and I said hey Jeff I called him up and I said hey man would you be interested in co-writing a couple of songs 
with me. I got some songs, and I'll send them to you. What do you think? So I sent them to Jeff, and he's like, I said, man, I love these songs. Let's get together. Let's write. Sure enough, he came over and just wrote. He's such a such a gifted guy, man, to, as a musician, all-around musician. Jeff isn't just your singer. He's a musician. He plays every instrument known to mankind, pretty much. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. And Yeah, he'll, he'll play from horns, bass, guitar, keyboards, and he's really good at it. And uh, and he came over to my house and recorded all the vocals on five songs, background vocals, lead vocals, everything, done. It was like in two and a half hours. Wow. I was like, oh, my gosh, this guy is like a machine. And so we put which slam you, together. Which you're, from what you said, you're like efficient like that as well. You're not dicking around. Yeah. I mean, studio was engineering and, and just creating in the studio environment. I was like, wow, this is a real really wonderful environment to work in because you know in your bedroom sitting on your bed with a little cassette player you only get a little piece of the entire picture when you're in the studio and you've got your drum machine or in your bass guitar and your keyboards you can complete the idea and see where it is you know so uh, after we did that and in the meantime I'm, I'm I'm doing slam. We tried and tried so hard to get that band because it was a fun band. And Jeff's like, hey, why don't we just put the band together and see if we can pull this off? You know, and I was like, okay, well, let's, you know, I left it kind of in Jeff because Jeff, when he gets involved in something, you know, he can head up the operation. He's he's clever, he's quick, and and he's a force to be reckoned with in terms of you know his stature alone. When Jeff comes into a room, you know it's Jeff. Yeah, you know. He's been around. He's done a lot. And so I respect it. I was like, okay, well, run with it, man. Let's see what we can yeah. put together. I'll, I'll kind of take the back seat on this. And we worked and worked and worked. And it was right at that extreme. Remember that ex- extreme they did? It was We were melting with the slam thing. We were melting the rap with rock, with funk. You know, that's Jeff's always been Jeff's passion. And we worked, worked hard. Just never came to pass. I remember getting that call from uh, Matt. Hey, George, <laughs> how's it going? Said, I don't know if you remember me, but this is Matt. I go, Bissonette, how are you, man? Haven't seen you in a long time. And this is while I'm in a band with Jeff in Slam. He's like, hey, I got this project going on, seeing if you're interested. I remember working and, you know, we demoed off those songs with, for Bo Nasty and always kind of was interested. You were, you're a writer, too. And, you know, he goes, how about we go out golfing and just talk about it? You know, so I'm, I'm a golfer. So we go out and we start talking about stuff. And I heard it, you know, I got together with him. I said, well, this is what I've been doing in the interim since Bonassi. So I played him some slam stuff with with Jeff and just some of the other songs. And he played me the demo tape that he had done with his brother. That was the very beginnings of the Mustard Seeds. And I was like, holy cow, this stuff is like kind of King Zexy. It's just like really, really a little more and more tangible, though. Yeah, really, really heavy. And I was the, the first song that I heard the vocals that's going on, how heavy it is, and just just the rhythmical sense him and his brother have. I was like, this is really, really cool. You know, I was instantly just overwhelmed. Like, oh my gosh, this is really, really good music. I'd love to be a part of this. And so he said, you know, we got together, we played golf. He's like, would you be interested in doing this? You know, I listened to it. He listened to the stuff I'd done. I'd go, man, I'd, I'd definitely be interested. And so I had to break it to, you know, Jeff and that I wanted to go and do this yeah. with, with Greg and Matt. This is, you know, these are two amazing musicians and I cannot turn this down. I can't let this go by the wayside. And so this is how the mustard seeds came to being with a phone call. And I went and I had and uh, I know that Greg is a very sought after musician. He's an amazing drummer. I mean, if there's 10 drummers in the world that you go, these guys are amazing guys. Greg Bissonette is yeah. one of them, you know. And so and same with Matt, you know. Yeah, for sure. And so I was I was my concern was Greg. He, his phone is ringing off the hook. Guys always want him to play on their stuff. He's mm. getting called for tours left and right. And so I kind of I kind of thought it out to myself and I and I went and I had a meeting with Greg and I said, Greg, if I, you know, I mean, you're going to be a part of this. And and I kind of threw it in his lap. I said, look, in order for me to commit to doing this, you know, I got to have you commit because I know how busy you are and I know how sought after you are as a drummer. And so I, I asked him, I said, look, it, 
if you can commit to a year, give me a year of your life to put this band together and we'll try as hard as we can, you know, to, to have a go of it. And so he did. And away we went. And it was really interesting when I auditioned for it was just me, Greg and Matt, you know, hey, George, why don't you come over here, learn a couple of songs and we'll audition. So it's just three piece. And I'd already been through, been so jaded with going through auditions and stuff like that. I was like, they were like, okay, well, we want you to be in the band. And I'm like, all right. And so uh, I had that talk with, with, uh, it was at the Sagebrush Cantina too, that I had that meeting with, uh, with Greg. But, uh, was that like a Mexican, like, well known Mexican restaurant or something? Oh, this, this is a killer place in, uh, in, um, past Woodland Hills up the 101. Just music every Sunday, Sagebrush oh, okay. Cantina. And we, and, and, Great music and just a fun place. Bikers pull in. There's a thousand people there every Sunday. Just a thousand people. Oh yeah, easy, Holy easy. It's smokes. a restaurant. They have a they have a a, a a you know an outside area where the bandwoods like a little band shell. Mm-hmm. And it was what a what a killer place. Every time chicks all over the place, motorcycles, bikers, just every walk. Bruce Springsteen's in there. Everybody who's everybody would come to this place on Sundays to get a beer. That's you know, so cool. to wet their whistle eat good food, good everything. It was what an amazing place. Anyways. So we're, um, we're, I, I go to, I go to Matt and Greg, they're like, okay, we want, we want to have another guitar player. I'm like, okay, great. And so I did one audition with another guitar player. This was pre Doug Bossy. And I'm like, I'm like, geez, Louise, I don't want to go through auditions. <laughs> I said, I said, Matt and Greg, you guys have a vision. I I get where you guys are coming from, but I don't want to, I wanted to do this completely different. I said, why don't you guys, you guys know where I'm at musically. Why don't you guys have the freedom to just try another guy, just like you tried me as a three piece and see if, see to choose that other guitar player. And then, then I'll come back in. And once you guys think here's, you know, here's one or two guys that we also would like to have in the band, then I'll play with that guy. We'll we'll play together as a four piece and see how it sounds. And that so they were auditioning a few guys, and then they go they call me up. I think and uh, I think we have the guy that we'd like, and it was Doug Bossy. Mm. So out of the blue, I get this call from Doug Bossy. I don't know who the guy is, <laughs> and I'm here and I'm here, you know, hanging with the Slam guys, and he's like, Yeah, I'm I'm. I'm, I'm driving out from from New Mexico to come and uh, you know to come and join. It, the band wasn't named, but the Greg and Matt thing, and you're the other guitar player. So I really look forward to this, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, on the on the phone, and I'm surrounded by th- the other band guys. Yeah. And I guess it was kind of sneaky or whatever, but you know, by the same token, I'm like, all right, yeah, cool, man. We'll drive safe, and I'll, I'll see you when you get here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I hang up. <laughs> then then we get together. Doug gets into town, and we audition. And so Doug and I get together. Doug's of completely different school. And this was brilliant on Greg and Matt's part. I'm from one school. Doug is from a completely other school. And so we get together and we start playing and just jamming. And we, we, you know, we learned, there was a bunch of songs that we learned from Greg and Matt's demo. And we played it. We sang it. The important thing about the Mustard Seeds was everybody has to sing. You cannot join this band without being a singer. And so Doug is an amazing singer. Matt's another amazing singer. Greg's a great singer. And I, I, I can sing lead, but I just prefer being the background guy. Yeah. And so we got together and we practiced our vocals. We, we try our four part harmonies and stuff and s- saw how we, the blend was and everything where everybody fit. You're going to be the tenor. You're going to be the low, you, this and that. And sure enough with Doug, Greg, Matt and myself, it just, gelled what a band that is man it just came together and it was like we kind of looked at i remember doug and i looking at matt and greg and we're jamming and doug and i we'd only known each other for you know a week couple of weeks and him and i are looking at each other going oh my gosh do you see what the heck is going on between these two brothers it's like (laughs) the same freaking dna and these guys are the rhythm section to the band that we're in. Yeah. We're in heaven. Yeah. We're the luckiest guitar players on the planet. And that's how <laughs> Doug and I looked at it from that point on. It's like, we're totally the luckiest guys on the planet to have these guys be in our rhythm section. And so we wrote and wrote and wrote. And then Greg and Matt were like, man, we got to play catch up with all these 
all these other bands, they've been together for years and years and years. And we got to kind of figure out everything in a really, really short span of time to become a band, you know, and to gel as four guys in a band. So what, what do we do? We start doing top 40 type gigs around town. <laughs> Just Every, to just to get chemistry together. Just yeah, to get yeah. chemistry together. That was pretty smart. Four, really smart on, yeah. on Matt and Greg's part. And we we were picking some eagles and stuff that really got gave us an opportunity to really practice vocals. Not only you know playing the songs, but most importantly singing the songs and how we harmonized and all that kind of stuff. And that's one thing that I got to admit is in every band that I've ever been, never have I ever focused on singing to the degree that that Matt and Greg wanted us to focus on, you know? And so we got pretty good at singing. We would do all kinds of crazy singing stuff that actually worked. And uh, anyways, after that year, clock is ticking with Greg, and he's getting calls left and right, you know, to go on this tour. No, I can't because I'm committed to the mustard seeds, you know. And what's really funny is we would do these top 40 gigs. Hey, what are we going to do? You know, we don't have a band name yet. Oh, let's go up and do these top 40 gigs as the Grateful Dudes. <laughs> so we would, so we were Grateful Dudes oh, doing the man. top 40 stuff. Anyways, the, the time that the clock had run out, we'd recorded the Bulldozer album with Greg. And we'd been, Matt had set up the two 12 track Akai. So we had 24 tracks and we recorded all the stuff, the demo stuff that we did with the mustard seeds in Matt's basement with his brother. And, uh, the rest is history. We, we recorded the bulldozer thing, but then there was a breaking point. A year had already gone by and Greg's, you know, He's being released from his contract, or at least what him and I had discussed. And it was stressful because, you know, Greg's in demand. You know, he's making money as a drummer out there. And this is at the apex of his career. Hold hold on one second. Let me just ask you, just mention something about that. I, I, I think I know the answer to this, but all the while this is going on, I'm assuming you're working another job or two or three. At this point in time. We were focused 100% on the mustard seeds. This is we finally came up, you know, decided on the name, the mustard seeds. And um, I, sh- I got to get you a couple of pictures of the demo tapes that, you know, that we had photographs of us guys from way back then. But anyways, we all we did was top 40 gigs. We made money from top 40 okay, gigs. Okay, so you made money from and that. We played. So we were basically starving musicians. Yeah, okay. Okay. You know, I, 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 I'll assume that Matt was living off his savings, Greg was living off his savings, and whatever residuals they were making to supplement their income. But we were making money as a four piece band called the Grateful Dudes and playing top 40 stuff in every little club we could possibly that would have us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we, our mainstay was Cafe Cordial. We did uh, another little club called Residuals. We did Montana's. We did The Jungle. We did, uh, it was a bunch of clubs that we would just rotate and play throughout Los Angeles. And we, we did what we, we, we set out to do. We, mm. we recorded that first album, but then that year had gone by and we'd had interest from some managers. Doc McGee got involved, hmm. and we're like, okay. We had Clive, Clive come down and see the band. He didn't get it. Nobody seemed to get it. Wait a minute. What was there not to get? I don't. I mean, was it or was it maybe because grunge was still the dominant force? I mean, well, in in a. Yeah, I mean, what we were doing is the Mustard Seeds off the Bulldozer album, which was the first album. It it just seemed, I thought that we were in that grunge vocal. I thought we were in the pocket with that thing. A little unique in terms of, you know, lyrically and vocally, you know, that the grunge wasn't. But Doug, Doug and Matt were sharing lead vocals, you know, between the two of them. Yeah. And and Doug's got a grungier, screechy, like more grovelly kind of voice. Not screechy, but grovelly, you know, and Matt had the clean, beetly kind of voice. There you go. There's, you know, the King's X, you yeah, know, yeah. formula. And so we thought we'd hit that, and we were doing kind of the beetly background vocals. Clive, Clive Davis didn't get it. 
Doc did. Doc got it. He was like, you guys, yes, I get it. I get it. But no, none of the record companies or people that Doc had brought down caught it. They didn't get it. You know, we did. We were like, what are we doing wrong? Why aren't these people getting this? And so, you know, it's at that point that, you know, we'd, we'd kind of run our course. And after having the wind blown out of our sails, especially for Greg, he's like, man, I'm getting these calls and, and I got to go and do something. I, yeah. You know, I, I got to make so, some money. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, you got to survive. And, and his stature in the music industry, you know, and just what he's accomplished in his career you know, I got to hand it to him, and, and I'm and I'm so thankful that he did commit to that time that sure. him and I talked about, and and I definitely commend him on that. It was I couldn't ask for more. Sure, you know? sure. And so it was it was time for for um, Greg to leave, and so we're like, oh, we'd had you got to remember when we when we played at Cafe Cordial, Greg is like such a sweet, friendly guy. All the drummers in L.A came out and jammed with the mustard seeds when we're at, you know, at Cafe Cordial or at Residuals or at Montana's. I mean, you name it. You can think of any drummer off the top of your head. They've sat in with the mustard seeds. The only guy that didn't, and I begged and I almost got on my knees to, to jam with us, was Terry Bosio. He wouldn't come Why? in. He would, oh, man, I, you know, I, he's just one of those guys like, nah, no, nah, I just came in here to listen. Really humble, really sweet. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Terry, I'm about to get on my hands and knees to <laughs> beg you, just come out and play like freeway jam or something like that, yeah. you know, some kind of Beck thing with us. But he just wouldn't. So, you know, but anyways, so we're looking for a drummer and every drummer, you know, was ready to take Greg's place. But, you know, Matt had a vision that, you know, I don't want to have, you know, the drummer be the focal point of this. We, you know, we just want a drummer. Yeah. You know, and, uh, those are big. That's those are big shoes to fill, and so we stumbled upon George Palacios, who was in and of it. It's, that that story is so weird. The way that happened, I did I did this gig at the FM station with, uh, you know, this Iron Maiden kind of thing, just to have fun. Guy calls me up, hey, I'm like, oh yeah, I know all the Iron Maiden number of the Beast <laughs> album. I'll play the whole ding dang thing for you. <laughs> Anyways, so I go and I do this, and one of the opening bands has this drummer. This guy looks just long, long hair. He looks like this Indian kind of looking dude, you know, and he's got super long, straight black hair. And he is playing. He's playing this Deep Purple song. Uh, what is it? Uh, Burn. Great song. Dude. Great Ian album. Ian Pace kills it on that yeah. album. And this guy is knocking it out of the park. I'm like, who on God's earth is this drummer? Who is this guy? This guy's like nonstop. You know, and so I, I go and play. He he loads out. He's gone. I'm like, oh my gosh! I didn't even get a chance to talk to the guy. I wanted to ask him. There's a he'd be a perfect drummer for the mustard seeds. So we're playing a gig up at uh, what the Pelicans Retreat. It's called. It was up past the Sagebrush Cantina. Greg's still playing in the band, and he's being, you know, he's being super nice while we, you know, finishing any of the commitments that we have playing shows. And who comes walking in? with the drummer that i was just I, I told the guys in the mustard seats i saw this guy he's this drummer he's so amazing he's so great he would fit in i i know it who comes walking in bossy comes walking in hey guys i'd like you to meet this drummer i did this session with and holy I look, smokes and there it is there's this guy george palacios and i look at doug and with I look doug at that's the guy. <laughs> Did he remember you like bumping into you at yeah, the session? To yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, I remember you doing the, the doing the thing, and I couldn't that believe it. So, so it was cool. meant to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, totally. So cool. George was so humble. He was just so such. A, George is a great guy. He's he's just kind, loving, and and just so fun. And his, his heart. I, the only way I can explain George is. He's a joyous man. He's filled with joy. Mm. Everything is fun to him. Everything is just cool. Look at that. Oh, my God. And so anyways, we audition him. And I'm like, wow, this guy's really good. He's two and four. George is a lot different than Greg, but he's freaking solid as a rock. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and when you when you we, we record right away, we record something. Here's play to the click. George nails it to the click track. You know, because we'd always record to click and stuff. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And, and it doesn't feel like you're playing to a click. It doesn't sound mechanical. It doesn't feel. And that's a gift that Greg had. Mm. He could just play. And it was incredible.
the way that guy would move around that click and it was just so musical george did the same thing and so we're like yeah this guy he's not somebody that everybody knows you know it's not like a myron grumbacher or, or somebody like that you know to join the mustard seeds sure enough george we say okay let's do it george you're in the band and so he joins a band and so we start recording writing right away and just trying to trying to do stuff, trying to play catch up with George, learn all the stuff that Greg did. Actually, George got together with Greg and, you know, how did you do that drum fill? You know, because some of the stuff that Greg did with the Mustard Seeds was extremely unique from a drummer's perspective. It made the song, you know, how he would do his Greg thing. And so, you know, George is like, wow, that's a crazy kind of lick. Maybe I should get, and we're like, yeah, get together with Greg. He's super cool. Yeah, Let's show yeah. you how he did it. He has students left and right. He's a teacher. He's an instructor, drum instructor. Sure enough, you know, he got together with Greg and, you know, drummers always like sharing that kind of stuff. And so Greg showed him some of those crazy licks that he did. And it was, it was just, it was awesome. And George fit right in. The singing part, we got George singing. He'd never sung before to the degree that we were demanding that he did. Wow. <laughs> but, but, uh, well, I give you guys it. credit too. It would have been a real convenient time to say, hey, man, let's just don't worry about the singing. We just got to get this done. You know, it, that was really cool that you stuck to sort of like the vision you had for what you wanted. Well, we had to because when we'd go out and play live, there were key key things that Greg was singing. Everybody had a microphone, and gotcha. without it, you're missing you're missing that you know the special sauce. You're missing that that ingredient, that that one note, you know, that harmony that fits. And so we we're like, George, you got to do this. And he's like, Okay, well, I'll try. But <laughs> and he did a great job, and he was singing. And um, and we writing tons of songs, man. We were just working hard nuts off we were just noses to the grindstone with george and i i i mean uh, greg uh, greg left such a you know so hard for any other drummer to fill in and i know that george he took it really he he kind of how what's the correct uh, way to describe it is you know he he jumped to the occasion. He 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 enjoyed the challenge, yeah. you know. And, and he did an amazing job. And then we kind of found our own groove with George on the new stuff that we started yeah. writing together as a band. And that stuff was even it was even crazier. It was like totally cool how George fit in and he did his thing and he brought something to you know to the band. So Mustard Seeds was awesome. And we did three CDs. Last one being Mustard Seeds 3, which was Doug had already gone off and done David Coverdale. He left mm. the Mustard Seeds. Mustard Seeds was kind of fizzling out. Doc McGee left. He got Kiss. All of a sudden, we're left out high and dry. And it's just like, what are we going to do with this? Nobody's getting this band. Everybody loved the band. Every club that we played in, they're like, wow, you guys are, the, you guys are awesome. You're singing. It's great. The music, the songs, everything is great. But none of the record company people got it, so it kind of took the wind out of our sails. We were all extremely passionate about the band, but it just never came to be. It just never came to pass. So Doug got offered the um, David Coverdale thing, and he took advantage of it, and I don't blame him. Yeah, Because sure. we're just sitting, what are you going to do? You have an opportunity here of, you know, to go and do something, write an album, go and do something that we're trying to do right now, yeah. and here it's handed to you on a silver platter. I don't blame you for taking it, yeah, you know, go sure. and do it, you know? And so we tried, you know, we tried another guitar player, Mike Wallace, and it was great for a time, but it just wasn't the same. Yeah. There was, there was a magic between, you know, George Palacios, Doug, Matt, and myself. It was a different kind of magic with Greg, but we kind of rekindled and we kind of found ourselves with George on drums and there was a magic and we just couldn't, any piece of that ingredient was gone there was a void. We couldn't right. fill it. It had to be that person. So we kind of fizzled out, you know, and so here we are in limbo. Man, what a great band. I mean, um, what a true... I, I, I have only listened to the third album. I'm not going to say I listened to the whole catalog and be a lie, but what an amazing, just a tremendous record. And it was like the talent scope on there. You know, the songs were like really melodic. This, you know... It's just a great album. I don't know what else to say. It's just a really well done album. It's a great rock record. 
you know, really uh, catchy tunes on there. You got some like funny slash fun songs like Billy Buckner. I mean, it's just some cool. Yeah. St- just, That's just, Matt. It's just cool stuff on there, man. It's just a great record. Matt is a prolific writer, and he's clever in some of the w- the way he looks at life. You know, same with Doug. You know, because Doug and and Matt would, you know, focus on the the lyrical content. Mm. You know, we'd all kind of we'd all kind of found our thing where Matt would share lead vocal responsibility with Doug. So Matt would sing the verse. Doug would take over in the in the in the B section of the song and sing the chorus. But Matt would still us guys would still support Doug with the background vocals right. and all that kind of stuff. So we found that kind of interesting niche and it's really interesting doug had already finished done the david coverdale thing and it, i think it was i think it was george or, or matt you know it's like maybe we should you know let's see if we can get together and write some songs and mustard seeds thing and it was really really interesting the way that last cd came to be is that it was just on a whim. Hey, why don't we just kind of rekindle Doug finished, you know, the David Coverdale thing, that thing. Oh, so that uh, wasn't like a uh, a, a planned no, birth, so to no, speak. No, it wasn't. It That's was like really a rekind- cool. it was a rekindling of the mustard seeds. It was like, okay, well, let's get together. So that album literally the all the music, lyrics and everything was written basically in like less than a week. Wow. And we got together. It was like, you know, hey, Matt, you know, Matt has a recording studio. I have a recording studio. George is down in San Diego. And we're like, hey, well, let's get the band together. Let's see if everybody wants to do the Mustard Seeds again. Let's let's do one more album. Let's see if we got it in us. Sure enough, we call up Doug and we're like, Doug, you know, would you would you like to get together with, you know, we'd love to have you come down and, you know, write another CD with us and, and, and just do it. We got together and it was, it's like we picked up where we left off, you know, it's just like we started throwing ideas around and in true mustard seeds fashion, everybody had an equal, this was the coolest thing about the mustard seeds. It wasn't like anybody dominated the writing. Nobody dominated what was going to be percentages. Everybody, there's four guys in the band. You each put in your quarter. Everybody has 25%. It doesn't matter if I came in with a song, all lyrics, all music, all, or anybody else. We split that song four ways. And so, even when you hired George, you brought him in as yes. a full band member. He wasn't a hired full, gun. Nope. Yeah, nope. yeah, I thought that was the I whole thought that was really, that really cool when you said that. I just wanted to it, confirm that's really freaking cool. And yeah. so we just we just wrote, wrote that whole entire third album, and it was so much fun writing that. It was that's where we had probably the most fun is when we're sitting in there. And Matt is such a fun, goofy kind of guy, and we would joke around. And we we did that, wrote that CD in less than a week, and then everybody would start doing little overdubs at their studios and sending the the track counts. There, Craig was. When I was mixing this, there were track counts of 120 tracks. On we're one, talking about on one song, on one song, being that there's you know, especially <laughs> oh. on the harmonies, the 10 cc kind of harmony things, and all that crazy stuff. One note would be sung four times. Wow! No wonder why it took a year to mix that thing. 120 tracks on a song. That's like, yeah, but that's oh. not you know. In all honesty, that's not even something you should be doing. That's something that like, I mean, you know what I mean? Because like, you're not a a, a mastering or an, a, an engineer. 24. That's something. That's like you know, painting. You know, you got to replace the roof, but it's the size of Costco, and it's your you know, you're you're you know, you're used to replacing roofs the size of a you know, 1500 square foot house. It was it was a major undertaking, but it was fun. Wow! It was totally fun, and That's these amazing, guys, man. Wow. With, with the and and Doug and I got together and we did guitars at my place, and it was just the. the I have to say, I played with a lot of guitar players, you know, uh, from the beginning, from way back when I was in grade school. Hmm. I had a guitar player in the band, and and throughout my, you know, playing guitar, Doug Bossy and I clicked in a way that's has never clicked. And, and really? I doubt it would ever, ever click like that again because we were from completely different schools. And every time Bossy and I would get together, something magical would happen. We would create a song that him and I would just look at each other and go, I don't know what just happened, but it's freaking cooler than the cat's meow. 
and it was just fun. And, and it was a relationship, a musical relationship that I can't, there's nothing I could compare it to. Usually, you know, there's a, there, there's a healthy rivalry between guitar players. There's, you know, there's a humility, there's humbleness, you know, and sometimes, you know, I know, I know that I could, you know, myself personally, and just working with Doug, there was something that always special happened. And everybody recognized it. Greg rec- recognized it. Matt recognized it. Everybody recognized it. So did Doug and I. That's know? great, and so, man. So I was pretty fortunate to work with him. And then after we did that third CD, we tried to get it going again. We, were, we said, let's screw it. Let's just release it on our own. And so... We tried and tried, and everybody liked it that we sent it to. We got it on CD Baby. We did, you know, some stuff. We got some hits. We got, you know, on people downloading it. We tried the YouTube thing and everything. Just one of those one of those bands that it, it, we did it, and it just never took off to the to the degree that we'd hoped or wished that it was. Yeah. But bottom line is, it was still a satisfying experience. Yeah, from from a musical standpoint, and from you know, if you really scrutinize the the mustard seeds and its lyrical content, it goes a little deeper than the average band. No, it's a great it's a great record in every single way. It's a really so, I mean, it's a great record. I mean, period. You know, you know, there's that's it. You really can't say anything about it. Okay, so a couple of questions for you. Um, first question: You've mentioned a couple of times. You said you and Doug are from totally different schools. Can you like elaborate on that? Doug, um, Doug is a blues guy. Stevie Ray Vaughan, Alan Holsworth, um, uh, uh, let's see, Dixie Dregs. I mean, these are connections that I have because I appreciate that music hmm. in terms of, you know, ability to play like Alan Holsworth, you know. No can do. I mean, there's certain things that I can grab, but the extent and and the <laughs> it take me. I don't know if I could ever do it. Totally you know? get it. There's a skill set that Doug has. You know, I'm from a school. Look at my whole entire guitar background is made in Japan. Gotcha. I sat with my with my guitar and I wore out made in Japan. Tommy Bolin. And just, dude, <laughs> ripping. Yeah. Listening to Blackmore rip on that, you know. And I would jam. You know, those songs go on for 15 minutes. Yeah. That, so, you, you know. It, that was a great album and, and all this stuff they did that was live. Um, oh, it was ridiculous. They, both live albums. Were, that for, Didn't they have a Japan made in Japan with Blackmore and made in Japan with Tommy Bolin? Uh, Tommy Bolin. To the best of to best of my knowledge, I don't know if there's live, but I know "Come Taste the Band" was done with Bolin. Yes, which was another ridiculous album. He just killed it. But there was "Made in Europe" with uh, um, Ian Gillan was on "Made in Japan" and uh, David Coverdale was "Made in Europe." And that was with Tommy, right? Nope, that was with Blackmore. Both are with hmm. Blackmore. There's some live album because I, I remember I always hear it and I always hear him say. For the first time, Tommy Bolin's going to sing lead guitar, li- sing, sing lead vocals, and he sings uh, an old, uh, uh, an old Tommy Bolin song. I can't think of the name of it. Du- 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 I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, um, anyway, sorry, we have. To, <laughs> I don't want to get off on that tangent. I apologize. Um, no, that's all right. Uh, okay, so the the other question I had was: so at this point, um, you. Like I've really now this is the third go round where you just put your heart and this one you know three albums worth this is a lot. How did you get yourself up at that point in time? Because I know me like you know when you get kicked down, no problem, get up. Kick down, no problem, get up. Three times in a row, you need a detox period almost. You know, you know with the with the mustard seeds, I didn't care what how if anybody got it i was like you know what this is still the band whether whether people record company or anybody gets it this is this is now about four guys and and the music that we make if we're confident we feel good about it and i can look at matt i can look at doug and i can look at george and say hey man we did something we we said something with this music whether anybody else gets it or not 
the four of us get it. And that's, that's what this whole world is all about is these four guys in the room that's, that everybody had a hand in creating this and everybody took a part in it that we took an equal and, and contributed equally as passionate musicians that believe 100% in what we're doing because everybody felt the same way. There wasn't a guy that was like, yeah, yeah, this is cool, but yeah, you know, hey, nobody felt that way. It was always everybody was very passionate and into it. And so to me, all I can say is, you know what, maybe people didn't get it. Maybe they will. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But but us four guys, we, I, I, as far as I feel, musically, just with those four with the with the other three fellas, I've musically accomplished my my dream from from a heartfelt point. When your heart says this is the real deal, this is right. It doesn't matter. What, nobody can take that away from you. So yeah. I I take that away from the mustard seeds. And but then again, I got to pay my bills. And then comes the next phase of how I entered Rick Springfield's thing. Go ahead, man. Run with it. How did it, how did that happen, dude? We just mustard seeds just got back from Germany. You know, we'd been touring over there. We had a record deal over there with a company called Marlboro Music, which, yes, the cigarette company. Anyways, we went over there. You know what Germany's like. It's all pop. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> even what it back, is. Even back then? Yeah, man. It was like crazy, you know. Hasselhoff was huge over there. You know, I mean, David it's a whole Hasselhoff. different. David Hasselhoff. Yeah, man, it's a wow. whole different. It's a whole different word. And du hast mich, you know, all yeah, that crazy yeah, stuff, yeah. dude. Oop, yeah, it was yeah. all that power dance, electronic kill type stuff. The mustard seeds were nowhere near that uh, kind of no. stuff. So <laughs> we we went over there. We tried, 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 and failed. Anyways, we went over there a bunch of times, but we did do two of the coolest things you can ever do in your life: rock and ring, rock and park. Munich Olympic Stadium and the um, Nuremberg Racetrack played with Brian Adams, played with David Bowie, oh, and a wow. plethora of other insane bands on the bill. That's and really so, cool. Oh, it was like insane, dude. Anyways, I get I get back from there, and then I get a call from a mutual friend of ours, Derek Hilland, who knows Doug Bossy. They go way back to you know, to um, what is it? New Mexico. Anyways, military kids, you know what I mean? Military brats. Mm. So anyways, I get a call and I'm, and Derek's like, Hey man, do you guys know any guitar techs? Do you know Rick's? I work for Rick Springfield and we just lost the guitar tech. And he's talking to me. I'm like, dude, the guy that we had working, or at least I had working for me in Europe, he stayed there. He got another gig while we flew home. He stayed over there in Europe. And so I don't, I don't, I don't know anybody because Ever since the beginning of time that I've been playing guitar, being that my dad was a luthier, oh. I've always worked on my guitars. I won't let anybody touch my guitar. If the guitar needs to be refret, I'm the guy that's going to refret it. Oh, I'm going to cool. do everything on my guitars. Anyways, I'm like, man, Derek, sorry. I don't know anybody. And they got they got to leave on the weekend. I got this call like on a Wednesday. They're leaving on Friday to go out and do a show with Rick. And Derek's always known that I've been kind of a you know, kind of a geek when it comes to guitars and doing stuff. He goes, look, man, I hate to bother you, George, but we're kind of in a bind. We need somebody to go out this weekend. And I hate to do this, but just throwing it out there. Would you be interested in just coming out and helping us out this weekend? I'm like, Derek, you know, if, if it's to play guitar, sure. But, you know, you're talking about as a tech, you know, I mean, well, I'm like, I'm a guitar player and I don't mean to like, bum you out but you know teching is it's a whole different animal yeah and you know but at this time i'm like man i gotta i gotta feed the family. i gotta eat I, yeah <laughs> i gotta pay the rent and i'm like well you didn't just have any kids curiosity yet, did you? no no kids yet i'm you're, married you're but married right? no kids right okay and my, call, my wife is in university doing pre-med right. so oh, the bills wow. are piling up yeah, she's yeah. got student loans out, out the yin yang and so i'm like i'm sitting there like okay i need a job i'm like Derek, just out of curiosity, what does something like this pay, you know, for me to go out there per day? You know, he gave me that number. I'm like, you know what? I think I can do it this weekend. <laughs> I think I'm available. You know, how hard can it be? Capitalism guys? at its finest. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, how hard can it be to work for them? And yeah. at this point in time, the only thing I know about Rick Springfield is there is, and you know, 
as musicians, we pay attention to, to music and good songs. As a songwriter, I'm like, this guy wrote Jesse's Girl, and that song I hear all the time. It doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter what country I'm in. Yeah. You're going to hear Jesse's Girl somewhere, sometime, wherever you are. And so I knew that about him, and I knew that he was a soap opera star. And then and, – and, He's like, well, he's not that easy to work for. He's going to like, he's going to throw you guitars and he's going to do, you know, he's like pretty wild. I'm like, throw me guitars. Yeah, right. Whatever. I'm going to tune his guitars for him. If he wants to throw them, great. They're going to land on the ground and break, (laughs) you know. (laughs) So I go out there and I meet him. Everybody in the band is just totally cool. I talked to Jack White, who was his, his touring drummer from the 80s. And I'm like, all right. So they hire me. For that weekend, I go out there, I meet everybody. Rick's totally a cool guy. He's like, yeah, I'm going to, w- I want you to catch these guitars. I'm like, what? You want to throw guitars to me? He's like, yeah, that's kind of my thing. And I don't know if you've ever seen Rick Springfield live no, back in the day. And even just within the last 16 years, he throws his guitars up like Ingve. He spins them around like it's a freaking baton. Okay. And it, I've never seen anything like it. And he was really good at it. He smashes, he'll take a bouquet of roses and he'll like Pete Towns in the guitar with the roses. There's rose schmutz all over his guitar. <laughs> it was like nothing I've ever seen, but the way he'd throw them and he's like, yeah, I'm going to throw them to you. So could you please catch him, George? I don't, you know, these are, you know, these are, ex- some of them are expensive guitars. Oh, yeah, I'm like, imagine. um, all right, let's here, throw it to me. Let's stand two feet apart. Then we started gradually, you know, okay, let's, you know, get a little more distance between us. And this was pre wireless. He was on a cord. So you had kind of like a kite tail keeping okay. the guitar. And, you know, I went out there, I did the weekend. I'm like, oh my gosh, this was kind of fun. Everybody's really, really cool and it pays good. You know what? I'm kind of, I could use some dough right now. Yeah. All he is is a weekend warrior. He goes out, we fly out on a Friday. Get back on a Sunday. Great. Maybe come back on a Monday, you know. But I'm like, this is easy. Everybody's really cool. Springfield, totally cool guy. I, I couldn't believe it, you know, how nice he was and how cool and how, uh, you know, just cordial How old is he? And polite. Like, uh, is he our age or older? Uh, he's like, no, I think he's 66, 67. Okay. a little bit older. And so... You know, I was like, you know, I could do this. There's Lance Morrison, the band, Jack White, David Whiston, um, uh, uh, Rick in the band, you know, and, and the road crew, uh, the road manager and the front of house guy. And I've known that front of house guy. He actually engineered Coming Up Roses on the Mustard Seeds song. Anyways, um, he, uh, I'm like, okay, I can do this. And so I started being Rick's guitar tech. I'm, I'm a man of many hats. I have, I'm a survivor, and so I do what I got to do. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to, and when it comes to paying the bills, I, it, hey, I'm still involved in music. And you know what? I'm I'm kind of a gearhead. I'm a geek, guitar geek. So fixing, soldering guitars. Although Rick Springfield would put a shit kicking on his guitars. Some of them, they never made it through triage. Okay, <laughs> they, just, they ended up being lumber for the fireplace, but. You know, it was always fun. It was always yeah. a challenge because some of them would get messed up. And I'm like, okay, I'm down to this last guitar. If he ruins this one, I've got nothing. And I got a Frankenstein something together to get him t- through the show. So it was kind of fun. Yeah. Dude, him and I would throw guitars back and forth. I would lob him a guitar. It would go up 15, 20 feet in the air across the stage perfectly. It would go like this. It would be like zzz. So you guys like had this down, like you could have made an info product on how to do it. (laughs) Dude, there's some pictures of him with a guitar just mid air and he would catch it and then he would fling it and it would spin around like, and so, and he would throw it back to me, dude. And it would come. (laughs) And sometimes he wouldn't be so, you know, it wouldn't be flying like perfectly through the air, airborne, you know, where he could grab it. Perfect. Sometimes they were line drives. Sometimes they'd be sliding across the floor to me. (laughs) But Either way, it was totally fun. And I worked for Rick in the capacity as a guitar tech for, geez, I would say at least three, four years. Good for you. There was a, there was a period where I quit. I was like, oh, this is just getting unruly. This is just getting crazy. You know, and, and I'm just, what am I? Is this where in, in life where yeah. I stop being a you know, a guitar player and become a full-time tech. Is this what's happening to me right now? 
you know, so it was kind of a little bit of reality check. In that time that I was working with Rick Springfield is when the Mustard Seeds 3 CD got recorded. So anyways, so you so you so musically, at least you were being satiated during the week with your work with mustard seed stuff. Right. And I was mixing that and recording mm -hmm. stuff with the mustard seeds. It it had already gotten to the point where we finished recording and I I was now mixing. And so this this is the tenure. My tenure as guitar tech with Rick Springfield was still being, you know, I was still working on my personal music so it, you know to me it wasn't that bad but there you know there was times where i was just like the touring thing the schedule 4 a.m in the lobby was just starting to get to me and the paycheck was great it was fun but I, I, you know as a guitar player you're like ah, like i said earlier is this where it's going to change is this where i'm going to become you know the guitar tech which it, there is it's a noble job yeah okay? yeah yeah i don't there's nothing it's a good there. job there is and if and I've met some great guys. I was a good guitar tech, dude. I was a great guitar tech, at least in my opinion. I could internet. I could fix every guitar. I could do everything that needed to be done to a guitar. You need a new fretboard. You need me to steam your rosewood off, and you need a new rosewood, and you need me to plane it to a 14 radius. No problem. I yeah. got you covered. You know, everything I could do. But, um, you know, just that thing, that guy thing, oh, man, I got it. You know, I want to do more and i'm kind of getting just sick and tired of yeah. running around the country and it was fun but i was like i started leaving lance morrison got the don henley gig that's when the call came jack white asked me um you know they all knew that i was in the mustard seeds you know all the guys in the band and and jack comes to me and goes you think matt might be interested in playing bass for rick i'm going well look at how about i give you his number you talk to him about yeah yeah it. you know so one thing led to another. Matt came on board, you know, into the Rick Springfield organization. Made it fun, you know. I got one of my buddies out yeah. there. And um, so then Jack, one thing leads to another. Rick's got to replace Jack, you know. And so to get another drummer named Roger Carter, this, this guy comes in out of nowhere. You know, we Rick auditioned George, who was the Mustard Seeds drummer, hmm. but George Blasios. had been busy raising, a, yeah, had been busy raising a family. His drum chops weren't where, you know, where the powers would be. You know, Matt and I knew, God, this is the drummer for you, Rick. You, you yeah, know? yeah. But anyways, Roger got the gig. Roger's a great drummer. I take nothing away from that man. He is solid as a rock. And Matt is always a clever guy. We're like, he's like, hey man, this George, what do you think of this drummer? And this is when I'm teching. I'm like, man, this guy's good. This guy's got his own vibe. He's got his thing going on. He's going, and Matt is his wheels are always spinning. Like it, it freaks me out how this, how this guy, you know, he, he's a prolific writer. And so, we get together with Roger. Matt goes, hey, why don't we just write a song and you know get together with Roger at the studio at, at Matt's house? I'm like, sure, man, let's get together. He, Matt's like, I got a couple of songs. Let's just record them and see how Roger does. We record a couple of songs. And after we do it, we're like, I look at Matt and Matt looks at me and we look at Roger. We go, wow, that was pretty darn good, that song. Well, I completed it. I mixed it, the song. And, and Matt's like, holy cow. And Roger's like, wow, man, that sounds great. I'm like, wow, this is really, really good. So what does Matt do? We're at the airport one day and um, we're leaving on a trip with Rick Springfield. So Matt poses to Rick. He goes, hey, man, Rick, we got this Roger George and I are putting this band together and we're going to record this album and maybe we could be your opening band. Right at the, you know, just right there at the airport. Sure enough, in two weeks, we record the first Squirts album, me, Roger, and Matt. This is, this is me as a tech, Rick's drummer. And, yeah, yeah. and, and so we, we do that and we come back two weeks later with a finished CD and Matt hands it to Rick and says, hey, Rick, here, we just finished the CD. Maybe we can open Rick listens to the CD. He's like, holy cow, you guys did this in what, two weeks? Are you guys out of yeah, your it's mind? It's pretty phenomenal. And he liked it, you know. And so any, anyways, powers of be, Rick says, hey, man, I, I, you know, I want these guys to be my opening band. He talks to the agency, this and that. So all of a sudden the squirts start opening up for Rick. <laughs> all this stuff just comes into being. And this is, I guess, when, when Rick kind of took notice that, hey, man, this guy's playing guitar. And so 
one thing led to another, and I, I never ever intended to, you know, have an ill effect on anybody in the band. But Rick, something happened with the with the guitar player Dave Whiston in the band, and Rick, I get a call from Rick one day and says. George, you know, I'd like you to be the guitar player in the band. We've, uh, we, we, you know, we've, we, Dave's no longer working for us in the capacity as a guitar player. And I'm like, whoa, Rick, you want me here? I'm the guy that's been sitting, drinking and hanging out with Dave, partying. He's my buddy, you know, drinking beers with him. And now you, you want me to replace him? Yeah, I go, dude, tough. that's, 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 I go, you know what, Rick? I got to think about this because this is this is kind of not cool, you know. For me, just from where I I stood, yeah, 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 it was a tough decision. And uh, Rick's told me on the phone when uh, I got to think about this. This is what I told him, and he goes, "Well, if it's not you, it's going to be Doug Bossy or somebody else is going to be playing guitar because Dave is no longer in the organization." He goes, "But you know, it seems you know you're you're a shoe in." on this you know we just have to replace a guitar tech so it was at that point i thought about it over the weekend i said let me get back to you after i think about it over the weekend i got back to him and said well if you you know it, it'll put me in a capacity where i'm playing guitar again so all right i'll take the gig i felt i was a little reluctant to because of the circumstances that it happened under but by the same token, I was like, well, look at I'm playing with Roger. It's the squirts. <laughs> I'm playing with Roger, man. His, his band is another, his backing band is another band. Yeah. Is the opening band. So you get a really good sound check, Rick, <laughs> 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 you know? So, well, and, and it happened. And so we got, so I ended up being Rick's guitar player after, you know, three, four years of working for him as a guitar tech slash stage manager, because I did all kinds of stuff as a stage manager. I was the only tech. I would set up all the gear for him, and I'd have it set up in like 15, 20 minutes. That included bass, drums, his guitar rig, and Dave's guitar rig I would have set up. That's great. I was like the only tech for Springfield. So, but you know, It was kind of good that he said to you, I bet, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to get Doug or somebody else to do it because that put the reality of it like someone's got to be there. If it's me, is you know, Dave knows I didn't cause this, and or whoever replaces him didn't cause this. Might as well be me. Well, but, this was this was Rick's decision, you yeah. know, and 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 I had in no way, shape, or form influenced that decision. I was just I felt bad because yeah. I, you know i hung out with dave and drank yeah. beers with him and, and we were like we'd go out hey let's go downstairs have a beer yeah you know and, and hang out so it was it was hard but when rick put it to me that way it was kind of it was a good ploy on his part but it certainly brought the reality of yeah. the situation to light yeah 100%. it was like well either i'm gonna do it or somebody else is gonna do it so who's it gonna be yeah. i said well give me at least the courtesy of a couple of you know, a couple of yeah. days to think it over the weekend and talk about it with my wife because this is, this is huge. Yeah, this yeah. is a big thing. So when I when I when I did decide that I was going to do it, I'm like, okay, well, if we're going to do this, let's. I don't want to just go in there and 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 fill in and just do the show as sure. it is. If we're going to change it up, let's make it. You know, let's not step it up a couple of notches, but let's polish some stuff off and let's make it. You know, make it. You've been playing. Own it. That's all. Like a, yeah. yeah, just own your own stuff. Yeah, and, certainly and he, you're, you're, he was comfortable enough with you as a player. If you're opening up, he's obviously going to let you make some changes to, to, to make it yours. I mean, all I wanted yeah. to do was to rehearse and polish it up yeah. a little bit, and 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 it was good for the band because it was a major undertaking for me. His shock, anger, denial, acceptance album. If you get a chance to listen to that Rick Springfield album. Listen to it. it it's going to freak you out. You're not going to know that it's Rick Springfield. You're going to go, who is this? This is not Springfield in any way, shape, or form. This album is so freaking heavy, it's beyond heavy. And when you hear it, you're going to be like, oh, my gosh. I couldn't believe that, that he did that album. And there's so many crazy guitar tones on that one. And that was when I joined, is when that shock, anger, denial, acceptance album was in full swing. And and the guitar would go from full on heavy grunge sound doo -doo -doo -doo, to a you know just total like it's going guitar is going through a megaphone. I'm like, how am I going to make this happen live? 
it was it was such an undertaking from a guitarist standpoint. And if you listen to that album, you'll understand. It'll immediately become evident what I'm talking about. Who did that and album in the studio? That was all Rick. He, he, all it was him. all him guitar playing. All him playing, and he did. Oh wow! Kill when you listen to that album, you're going to hear Rick Springfield at his best. In my opinion, he just went balls to the wall as a guitar player, as a writer, and as a singer. And undeniably, that is the epitome that every person that ever says anything about Springfield that ah yeah okay Jesse's good yeah he's a soap opera star. Listen to that album. Come back and talk to me when you listen to that, and yeah. we'll talk because he kicked it out of the park. That's nice, that. man. And and I, it freaked me out. And so I'm thinking to myself, how the hell am I going to do this live? I had a crazy rig, dude. That you know, I'm like, okay, I got to jump from the biggest sound in the world to this little goofy little sound. So, you know, I was running a stereo rig, and I had one amp in the center that I did all through the all through the pod. And I spent hours tweaking sounds to get all those crazy, goofy sounds. So I had it set up where I could step on a button and I would just go through the pod amp that would make the goofy sound, different weird megaphone guitar sound or whatever specialty guitar sound there was. And, you know, clean sound and all that kind of stuff. So it was that's why I wanted to rehearse, because I'm like, well, if I'm going to do this live, I don't want it to be hack. I don't want to just hack through this. I want it to represent what he did, because he did such a phenomenal job on that album. I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to be representative of that in terms of, hey, I'm ca I'm capturing at least to a degree what he's doing and how he did it, because it was so freaking cool. Well, you know, I just thought of something too. You know, you thought it was awkward you stepping into the lead guitar position. Imagine the poor son of a bitch who has to step into the guitar tech position, and now you're oh, the former tech, and he's got to come is, and fix your guitar. That that's is, a whole freaking story, dude. That the, the, that whole thing is that is a tough one, man. That was fun. It was fun doing the Springfield thing from that point on as a guitar player and being. Rick Springfield had the doors closed for many, many years, co-writing with people. And kind of, it was kind of a sheltered thing. It's, you know, I'm going to take care of the writing and everything. And Matt being a prolific, fun guy, a writer and everything, and having a track record that he did, he opened those doors to Rick. And Rick and Matt wrote three albums that were phenomenal. That's great. So all they those collaborated. Th those three albums that that you were on, yes, Venus, Songs for the End of the World, and Rocket Science. Matt co-wrote mm -hmm. those. That's really yes. freaking cool. So, were, were you you were both studio guy and touring guy with him? Yes, I was fortunate. It was it, Rick. I think kind of saw how Matt and I were. Matt pushed for it too because Rick would get you know he he could have any guitar player you want. Sure. He's got the funds they can pay. They can pay Tim Pierce. You can have, you know, yeah. Luke get on it. He yeah. can have anybody he wants play guitar, but just the, the relationship and the working relationship that I'd had in the past with Matt was yeah. in and of itself, you know, there's a history there and we just work together well. And, you know, Matt's like, yeah, I'd like to have George play on this stuff. You'll, you, you'll like the way he does it. Rick liked what I did live. He's like, Hey man, I heard what you did on, we did two squirt CDs and you know, he heard the mustard seeds. He's like, well, I like what I hear. So why not? And then it was on the um, songs for the end of the world that I did something that um, hadn't been done on the guitar thing that kind of, was interesting that Matt inspired, you, you know, Skrillex. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there was, they wanted something on that album and Rick's always looking for these new, innovative, crazy things to do. And so Matt was like, man, listen to this Skrillex thing. What's going on. And I was like, and, there, and some of the songs were really, really heavy that Rick had written for the, for not the Venus and overdrive, but the, other, but songs for the end of the world. And so Matt's like, man, if we could incorporate so i was and i'm listening to it and it was in rick's kitchen i'm like yeah i could do that with guitar don't need to do that with keyboard it'd be even twice as cool as with the guitar to do all that scratch <laughs> and all those weird backwards and just edit it together to a song and there was there were like two or three really appropriate songs that that could fit in perfectly on rick's album so i went i went home and i said look at i got to do this in my studio because this is going to 
this I've never done this mm. before, and I know where you guys want to go with it, but I kind of want to make it my own kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And and so on that album, there's I don't there was a B side to one of the singles. There there was this really stupid heavy song that Rick wrote. It was just so heavy. It was like so out of character for him. Not really out of character because he loves heavy stuff. But for, when you look at the contrast between that song and the pop Rick, it's so yeah. different. So, you know, anyways, and I did this Skrillexy kind of guitars on that, the stuttering. They called it the stutter guitar. And it would be this weird rhythmical stutter. And you can hear it all over that album. They, they All of a sudden they're sending me, OK, George, put that stuff on this song. Put that stuff on this song. Put you know they gave me a whole, almost the whole album of songs. We want that stuttery guitar on everything, George. You know it's like okay, you're going crazy on it because that stutter stuff only kind of works really lends itself to a halftime kind of beat where you can really really freak out on it. So, but anyways, it, I did that and it was fun doing that. It kind of reinvented myself in terms of hey, you know I'm not I'm not an Ingve Malmsteen. I'm not a you know speed guitar playing freak like that, but on the other hand, when it comes to the studio the trickery and production and sound and tweaking sounds and doing something that's different and out of that nobody's kind of done before, it was kind of fun doing that. So I, at least I had an opportunity to do something as a guitar player that I think hadn't been done before. That's awesome. You know, I also think it's pretty cool that um, your work that you did with the mustard seeds – you did get paid for it with Rick Springsteen. Springfield. In, I'm sorry, with Springsteen with Rick Springfield in a sense. You know what I'm saying? Even though I know you you weren't like that didn't mean anything to you, but it but it's funny how those things work cuz you did get, you know, the payoff was, you know, Matt knew you and your work ethic and your playing and knew it would be a fit and pushed for it, and encouraged it. It, it, it was, and I'm and I'm thankful that Rick said, "Yeah, let's do yeah, it." So I, very I cool. got to record the three CDs, and it was awesome. I I, I even got to write a song on one of the songs called uh, uh, called Gabriel, which is a it's it was a fun song. It was a, it was a it was a squirt song that it orig- If you heard the original, to compare it to what Rick did with it, Rick is that guy's an amazing writer. I learned so much about that man and gained so much respect for him because I came from a, from such a limited knowledge of Rick and his talent and what he is capable yeah. of doing. You know, you, you can only judge a book, you know, if, if, judging a book by its cover, you know, and then when you actually get in there and you read the book, read, read the know, pages. See, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sir. You see, you see the depth of, of Springfield and it was, it was really, really cool working for him. It was probably, you know, it was probably in terms of, you know, being out there and, and working because I worked for him for 16 years. You know, it was probably the longevity and the highlight of being a hired gun hmm. and working for a guy for 16 years, you know, and, and enjoying it and it not being not being a drag yeah, being yeah. fun all over being surrounded by your friends coming to know somebody having having a guy like rick that guy's a star he's he's unbelievable live it, it, when you see him live it's you can't believe what the guy does live but it's it's pretty amazing it was fun being a part of that but then i had kids oh uh, so you basically left to come to move leave la and move here to nashville to re- to well I, I i left you know, when I was still in L.A., but what was the deciding factor was the phone calls from my wife. You know, I, I can't do this alone. I've got two kids at home, you know, and so it was getting hard. It was getting hard on me in terms of those conversations yeah, with my sure. wife on the phone, being a dad, you know, in my career, you know, at my age, I'm like, yeah, I could keep on going and going and going. Rick's, I mean, he looks great. He's still doing it. Yeah. But there was a point where I'm just like, well, I'm a husband and I'm committed. There's for better, or for worse, and sickness yeah, and in health till death do us part. Mm. I'm like, th- those are words that resonate with me. So yeah, I man. have to go home. And I remember when, when I made the call to Rick, you know, we had had a lull. Usually, you know, from Christmas on, you know, there's a lull in the Rick Springfield touring schedule. And I'm like... You know, January comes around. I'm like, ah, man, my wife is, I love having you home. It's your contribution at home. It's just, you know, 
I can't do it without you. And this proves, you know, your contribution to this, to our family. And I'm like, I know what you mean. So then we were about to pick up touring again, you know, and I'm like, I called Rick and he was doing a New York daytime show or something like that. And I'm like, Rick, I can't, you know, I got to leave. He's oh, I'll take, you know, take the time that you need and we'll get somebody to fill in for you while you're taking your time. And I'm like, I don't think you understand. I have to quit. I, I can't work for, you know, Rick Springfield yeah. anymore. I have to quit as a guitar player being your guitar player. So he got it right away. You know, he goes, you know what? He won a Grammy and he quit to raise his son, both his sons. So he totally like, got it. He totally got it. It wasn't like, oh, dude, really? Oh, dude. He was like, it, in the second breath, he says, once I told him, I go, I got it. Lori is calling me. She's, yeah. She needs me at home. He goes, I totally get it. You don't have to say anymore. I completely understand. I did the same thing to raise my family, to raise my boys. And so I got to hand it to him from that respectful standpoint that he understood where I was coming from. And, he, you know, by his grace, he said, good luck, man, go and do your thing, you know, raise your family. I didn't know how I was going to do it because I was making great money with Rick, mm. you know, it was consistent work. I was playing guitar, I recorded on the albums. Now what am I going to do? So mm. I got to reinvent myself now. So, you know, here I am in Nashville now, left L.A. What made you, know. you What made you leave L.A.? Um, I just started getting, it started getting hectic in terms of, you know, where California is as a state in terms of, you know, I'm not working for Rick anymore. Yeah. So oh, it's not, ridiculously expensive. <clears throat> so that's a consideration. All of a sudden fi finances are, yeah. you know, what if I don't get a job for three years? What, what, what am I going to, you know, what are yeah. we going to do? You know, how are we going to pay for things? You know, yeah, we had our savings and all that kind of stuff, but you don't want to burn through that. You no. don't want to, you know, just complete chip. Then what do you got left? You know? And so California started doing some crazy things here and not to get political, but it just, the taxes were being increased yeah. things, you know, my truck to, to register my truck went from, you know, 200 bucks. All of a sudden it's almost a thousand dollars to register my vehicle. Diesel, my buddy diesel was gas. telling me something about that. He, he, uh, Something like he wanted to buy a, a sports car, like a used five year old sports car. He said it cost him uh like eight grand or something like that. I was like, What do you mean it costs you eight grand? He goes, Yeah. Because he's in San Diego. I was like, Holy crap, man. There's there were all kinds of things like that that are going on that I'm like, this is gonna break the bank. We we're not gonna be able to survive here. We're gonna lose the house because I I built our house. Sure. I was the I was the architect and the general contractor. On, on our house in Lakewood. And I was like, we're going to lose this place. Yeah, yeah. It's the, you know, the bank is going to take it away if we mess this up. So we're like, well, why don't we sell it and, and move somewhere? And we've been coming to Nashville. You know, it's music town, first of all. I've got a yeah. bunch of buddies here. And my wife works in the medical, in the medical industry. And um, I was like, well, you know, I've been going to Nashville. Would right. you consider moving to Nashville? So I asked my wife and she's like, in, in true wife, you know, research type fashion, <laughs> medical, she goes online and she researches and all of a sudden finds Vanderbilt, the hospital. Right, right. And sure enough, the specialized field that she is in working at, uh, in the medical field in California, there's an opening here. So I said, well, why don't you get on an airplane, come down here, you know, go to Nashville, see what it's like, see what the, I've been there at least once or twice a year for the last 16 years with Springfield. I know what it's like. It's a great town. Really cool. Wonderful. Really cool town, music town. And so she came down here. I picked her up from the airport after, from when she got back to Los Angeles. She, she just looked at me. Hi, how's it going, honey? We're moving. That's Good. what she tells me. So she got the job or she got the connections that, there and she liked she, it? She liked it there. Yeah. The, the facility was great. The people were awesome. Everything just seemed to fall into place. So I was like, okay, well, now this you want to move, all right? Well, let's try to make this happen. So that was the decision Good. beyond, you know, for us to to get to here to Nashville. California was becoming. Believe me, I love California. I've traveled all over America with Rick, and even to Europe and stuff like that. I would default to California every time. I'm like, this is the most beautiful place on earth. Yeah. The climate is fantastic. You got mountains. You got ocean 
you couldn't ask for more, but just financially, you pay it for it. Challenge you do, yeah. and you know, and there were other other factors having children and some of the other things that were going on sure. in that state just didn't align with where we were at as a family. Sure. So I was like, okay, well, let's let's move to Nashville. Everybody else seems to be. Let's check it out. She got the <laughs> job here. Here we are in Nashville. <laughs> That's all. I love I love Nashville. I think the people there. You know, I started these interviews there, and everyone there was like, uh, just like so supportive, and every, it's just a really nice community there, man. I just think the people in general are quite friendly and it's genuine. It's a really cool town, and it and we kind of, you know, our kids are into, you know, we hopefully want to get a little mini farm here because we oh, our cool. kids do the equestrian thing. So it's great, but you know. I, from from a musical standpoint, being here in Nashville, it's like bringing sand to the beach. Oh, yeah. it's great! Another guitar player in Nashville. Just, we need that like another <laughs> hole in the head, right? Well, you got your but, buddy Doug comes in a couple of times. Man, a year. absolutely! Which I just cool. you know we we just got together with him and and the the other guitar player that that works for Rick now that took my place, George Nastos. He lives out here. He's a great guitar player. I've known him for years, and um, you know a bunch of guys from L.A. are out here. Yeah. So I've got a whole horde of fellas that that's <laughs> right man. here and even the other guitar player from lee aaron john that i mentioned way you're back you're kidding he's, me he's here i'm gonna get together with him this weekend that's funny you know just go out and catch up but he's been out here for 20 some odd years in nashville so it's like i got buddies from canada from california very cool they're all man. here so it's exciting george let me ask you this what this has been a big long journey from you for a long time what have you learned about yourself through all of this um <laughs> I, I what have i learned about myself that's a good question i've learned some of my shortcomings they become evident you know they can they can come up and slap you in the head at the most inopportune time and be a real reality check over the course of my career i've learned that Patience and, and empathy are very, very important. They're key ingredients. Were you always empathetic? No. I lack empathy and compassion sometimes. Yeah. Because I, I, I'm, a, you know, uh, how do I say? I'm more. More logical? Yes. And yeah. so, so when you see something happen, it, it, you know, I see why that happened. You know, like if if a, if yeah. a kid falls down, you, you, you know, you don't default, right? Oh, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? Oh, you tripped over that shoe because you left the shoe there and you didn't you didn't put it away. And, and you know, I look at yeah. life through that lens, and so sometimes empathy and compassion go by the wayside. Sure. So I'm trying to be, become, you know, trying to become more in tune with that aspect yeah. of life. You know, and you know, and when I look at my career. There were, there's a bunch of times where I go, man, you know, when you're an older guy, you're going, yeah, golly, I wish I wish I wasn't such a dick. Yeah. That in that point in my life, mm -hmm. I could have been I could have handled that a lot differently. So there's a lot of that that yeah. goes on, yeah. you know, but hey, that's life. We all we all carve our path. And sometimes what we leave in our wake can be good. Sometimes what we leave in our wake might not be so good. Yeah, no, I totally get that. I've I've tried to make uh, clean some of that up, like with my kids. Not not that I was like mean or anything, but I think uh, as a younger dad, I had my first son when I was twenty six, which I think is really young. Uh, but um, yeah, and I've always gone back, and I, I, I've really it's been important to me to go back to them and say, "Hey guys, you know, remember when this happened? I probably could have handled that better, and I apologize. I didn't, you know." And I don't think there's been any like. It wasn't so detrimental as like a, a burden that they're carrying around. But it's me. You know, I, I feel bad, you know, so I feel good about, you know, just owning it. I don't have a problem apologizing with shit ever. So right. I, I totally get that, what you're saying. Um, we didn't talk about your childhood a lot, but what's your best childhood memory? Ooh. Finally getting, talking my mom into getting that sunburst strat that I wanted. <laughs> Spoken like a true guitar player. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you. And you know what? My mom was, my, my mom was so on the ball. Here's, here's the choice in, in a real, in a nutshell. My mom gave me a choice. Canada. It's all about hockey. Okay. Right. Growing up uh, hockey. I was, you know, I was 
since I was a kid, because my dad was a luthier, five years old, we're playing. We didn't have TV in the house. TV broke down. Our family, grandma played a bell like, mom played the accordion, dad played the guitar. He made guitars awesome. downstairs. So our TV broke. What would what would we do after dinner? We would play folk music and sing as a family, gather around. I'd pick up the guitar, learn. Anyways, there was my mom gave me a choice. My dad left at a very early age, so my, my memories of my dad are few and far between. Mm. Some of them some of them are horrific stories because my dad was an alcoholic and some of the stuff some of the past was abusive and awful. Sure. I won't go into that. But my mom, she was a tough gal, and she, she gave me a choice. She said, okay, look, it. Uh, I'm glad that you're interested in hockey, but you have a gift for music. She goes, now, because I'm a single mom, I can only give you one, and I want you to think about this. I will support you 100% if you go into music. I will also support you 100% if you go into hockey, but you only get to choose one. You don't get to do both. And so I sat there, and I pondered that for a long, 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 long time. You know, it took me probably, I don't know, a week to come up. And I said, Mom, I want to do guitar. She goes, OK, I will support you 100 percent. I'm like, OK, Mom, well, to show your support, there's this <laughs> Stratocaster. That I really want. Uh, you know, she, to and show she, your support. Always, you should have done sales. <laughs> Gosh. But anyways, she says, absolutely. You're you like need closing to do this. the deal with her. You know, Man, you're like you took her to the logical. Cl- great. <laughs> I want you to I want you to be able to you know feel good about your decision mom so here's how you can do that. <laughs> Holy smokes, that's a good Dude, I had to mow the lawn guy. all summer and 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 I had to she goes, "Well, you make money mowing the lawn, mow the neighbor's lawn, mow our lawn, take out the garbage, do these chores, Whoa. come up with come up with some money that you can put towards that strat and I'll match it or double it." Man, that so is So I was the like, "Okay." Thing. Yeah, we do the same. You got to get these kids having skin in the game, man. And so my mom, that's what she did, dude. That's great. She, I went and she, but the funny thing is we walk into the music store and she goes, George, I think that gold top Les Paul would be a better choice for you. <laughs> it was a, there was a gold top, beautiful gold top deluxe. And she's, I think it'd be a better choice than that Stratocaster. She goes, I know you like the Stratocaster. You know, I'm all about Richie Blackmore and Jeff Beck and all these Strat playing guys, Clapton and all these guys, Hendrix. And I'm like, just eyeballing the strat. And she's like, ah, I don't know, this Les Paul. But I'm like, no, 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 mom. I want this strat. So she she got me the strat, got me a little amplifier and dude, and a fuzz face, a fuzz wah face. Very cool. Pedal. Dude. And I was just tearing it up in the house. That's awesome. <laughs> Is your mom still around? Is your mom no, still my around? mom passed my mom passed away. Oh, I'm away. sorry. Oh, yeah, she, she sounded like a great away. gal, man. She was totally awesome and extremely supportive and a key a key player in you know, where I am today is from a musical standpoint because of her support. And this is without the dad. Dad gave me the skills in terms of the luthier stuff because I'd be down there building guitars with Mm. him. But from just, here's what you got to do, son. Here's how you work at it and get good at it. I'll take you to the Royal Conservatory of Music. There was a whole protocol that she had lined out. That's really cool, man. I'm glad mm -hmm. you got to enjoy that relationship with her. Two more questions, man. I could talk to you forever. Uh, tell I know me, I've been talking way too much. No, no, this is everything's been interesting, man. Tell me something about yourself people would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Huh. That's an interesting question. I know I find a little odd about me. Well, <laughs> my interests are, are not only guitar. I have so many other interests. Everything that I look at, I want to know how it was made, built, painted, done, manufactured. And so <laughs> I've got so many of these other things, pending things that I want to know about. I'm, that might be something that's odd about me. I just don't focus on one thing. It, you know, I kind of look at all computers. I had to build my own computer because I figured I could do it better than the guy that I was, you know, <laughs> buying. You know, better so, than Microsoft or Apple. <laughs> well, just, you know, just putting them together. I, I put yeah, together yeah. I put together recording studios. Once I found out that you can record on a computer mm. and all that software, I was like, okay, I'm going to build my own supercomputer. It's going to be my recording sure. studio. I, I'm not a Mac guy. I'm a PC guy. So you can really hot rod them. So I totally got into hot rodding 
computers. So I just have other interests. Good for you, man. I think other interests are important. And last question, George, and you might have answered this a little bit. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of this change has been deliberate and intentional on your part and how much is just a part of aging? Um, you know, the biggest change in my life is coming to faith, Craig. You that, know. And how long is it? That? That, you know, that's been an ongoing process. You know, I've been a, I've been a, 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 how do you say that? A work in progress. Yeah. You know. In that in that whole thing, in the faith department, and, and that's probably been my biggest biggest change, my biggest challenge in life. Not you know, hmm. a, a, a passion to learn things and to you know that that proverbial question, you know, is our existence mean something here? Do or is it you know all those questions and and my coming to faith. And learning, and this is, goes hand in hand with being more compassionate, empathetic, and stuff like that. There's a couple of things that you know that I try to that are great examples to to just live by, especially in this day and age. And and one of them, and, and I always revert to this because it, it puts me on a straight straight path. And it, and and it's love others as I have loved you. And that uh, there was a guy that that came. And, and proved it and showed it. And so I'm just like, wow, he didn't show ever any animosity, anger, or hate towards anybody ever. Hmm. And so I just use those words and, and remind myself when I'm being a dick, <laughs> you gotta be a, you gotta kind of chill out, buddy. And, and so in my, in my aging years here, I'm just trying to not trying to make up for my shortcomings, but trying to understand and trying to accept people, yeah, man. you know, as they are, and just look at life and look at people from the good within them and the positives in them, you know, and capitalize on those and focus on those as opposed to just looking at the negatives of people. Ah, oh, this guy's that. Ah, oh, I don't like that. Ah, oh, that drives me nuts. This and say, well, let's find something good about that person and let's focus on that because if I embellish that and, and focus on that, any conversation with that person or anything, yeah. it's it's just all around better. So well, Good for you, man. I'm glad that you've uh, that's helped you out a lot. And it sounds like you're on a good road, man. Well, you know, it's it's just the road of life, moving at the speed of life. <laughs> Man, I, I really enjoyed this. I cannot thank you enough for your time. I want to tell people where they could at least, you know, uh, find you. First of all, it's George Bernhardt, B-E-R-N-H-A-R-D-T. What I would encourage you all to do is go check out the mustard seeds. Um, I begged George. He's got a bunch of mustard CD, mustard seeds, three CDs. And I said, man, would you sign them for people who listen to the show if they uh, want to buy them from you? So uh, he's agreed. It's um, go listen to the mustard seeds three. It's a phenomenal album. And then go buy a copy of George. And he's got a special email address that you can send it to him. I'll give you the email. Address. It's one unknown artist, the number one, numeral one, unknown artist four the number four and the letter u so it's one own unknown artist for you at gmail.com and he will personalize it you contact him if you want to personalize it to to you i'm sure he'd be happy to do that um man i i this has been real good i'd like to pick this up a part two hey you know what'd be cool man when um when you decide what you're going to do musically if and when that happens up there man and once that's up and running let's come back on the show and talk about it absolutely I know, I know Doug's, Doug's coming down here and he's always inviting, Hey man, let's get together. Let's do this. You know? Oh man, so I smell mustard I will, seeds for, <laughs> I, I never, I never turned down having fun with Doug because he's there's, a great just guy, this, man. there's just things that happen as guitar players. And, and I want to keep that going until I'm an old and gray guy just yeah. goofing off with Doug because we've, it's, it was, and has been, and will always be fun creating with that guy yeah man you got miles together with him um 
George, thank you very much for everything, man. I, I can't. Thanks, Craig. Time. I, I'm sorry for talking so much. No, man, this is cool. <laughs> ah, you're perfect, man. This is great. I really appreciate you sharing the stories, being real, being vulnerable, and uh, mostly keeping it real, man. I, that's never apologize for that. Oh. Uh, Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks so much to George Bernhardt for spending time with us. Please go look at the Mustard Seeds, man. It's one of the greatest bands ever around. Um, I really appreciate it, George. Go to Everyone Loves Guitar. You're welcome. Go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes. Get up on our mailing list. You definitely want to do that, uh, along with some early product announcements and discounts. And remember, most importantly, happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.